Welcome to lesson 22. <coughs> uh, so far, we have learnt about the basic functioning of a PLC, we have learnt uh, how to write a program for it. But all this time, we have seen the PLC as an abstract device. We haven't seen uh, what is inside a PLC system, what actually physically makes it. So in this lesson, we are going to look at the hardware environment of the PLCs, basically uh, what PLC systems are made of, right? So uh, we are going to look at uh, components, we are going to look at components of the PLC system their architecture by which I mean that how they are organized, how they are connected and their functionality that is describing what they do, okay. So now, so let us see, before we begin it is customary to see the instructional objectives. So the instructional objectives are the following. First after going through this lesson, one should be able to mention the distinguishing features of industrial automation computational tasks. A PLC basically is, is, a, is a computer. So it computes, computa it performs computational tasks related to industrial automation. But these tasks have certain very distinguishing features compared to the other tasks which are let us say done in an, in an, in an office environment. So we are going to you should be able to mention some of these features. Mention major hardware components of a PLC. Describe major typical functional features and performance specifications for the CPU, central processing unit, IO or input output, MMI, demand machine interface, and communication modules. Okay. Then explain the advantages of a function module. So what are the advantages of a function module, you will be able to explain. And describe some major typical function module types. So these are the instructional objectives. So let us start with the industrial automation tasks and their distinguishing features. So we are going to look at the nature of industrial automation what I call IA computation, that is computation related to industrial automation. These kind of computations remember that are always working on physical signals, right. So there are uh, temperatures and pressures and uh, limit switch positions, starter positions, etc., which are all very physical uh, signals, electrical in nature, which are interfaced with the PLC and the PLC looks at its values and takes this some of these are inputs and computes the output which uh, it computes according to some its its software for example relay ladder logic programs okay these tasks requirements are i mean by uh, by standards of other applications using computers let's say uh, let's say let's say digital communication or uh, personal computing these tasks are the 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 computational requirement of these tasks are generally called slow, are generally, I mean, should be slow. Although among themselves, there could be tasks which are very slow. For example, temperature control tasks are very slow, having time constraints of the order of minutes. Let's say flow control tasks would be faster. And if you have a machine control or, you know, you, you have to have a, a, a an actuator control, electromechanical uh, control actions. So in such cases, the tasks are relatively faster. But even those, you know, basically they are all made of to move, to move an electromechanical system with a certain uh, finite amount of power generally requires times of the order of milliseconds or at, may, at most a fraction of a millisecond. Before that, no perceptible motion will be produced. On the other hand, these, these speeds are much 
slower compared to the speed of electronics which we typically encounter in let us say communication system. So, in that sense they are slow although within the their, their own categories there can be fast tasks and slow or medium fast tasks or even slow tasks right. So, that is what I wanted to mean when I wrote slow fast. The complexity of these tasks are also not very complex some of them are some of them are very simple relay data logic diagrams are often very simple, but there are other there could be other complicated control algorithms there could be uh, self tuning algorithms which are which are which could be somewhat complicated. So, I would say that the complexity of these tasks are you know low to medium not highly complex. Interestingly many of these tasks are repetitive for example, if you take a standard process control loop then every sampling time you have to input the control variable and based on your control law sense the set point and then compute the manipulated variable right. So, this 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 computation of the manipulated variable and inputting the set point and the uh, control variable goes on repetitively. So, these are generally repetitive tasks and they are and they are real time any computational task is called real time when there is an there is an explicit time boundary by which this task should be completed and this fact is actually taken taken into the design of the design of the computational system which is supposed to perform this task. For example, in a in a in a control loop whatever computation you are having that should be completed within a sampling time. So, so there is a there is an associated uh, deadline for completing these tasks once they are started. So, you, so you in other words even if you have a very grand control algorithm which takes a lot of time and does not complete within a sampling time is is not at all suitable rather a uh, less probably a less grand control scheme which will complete within the sampling time will be preferable right. So, in that sense they are real time and for real time tasks you want one has to because you know we you have to also realize that within one PLC there will be several control loops working either rungs either they are discrete sequential control or they are analog controls whatever it is there are a number of control laws which have to be repetitively executed right. So, there is a requirement of determining that which should be run at what time because some of them will have to be run let us say every 20 millisecond, some of them may have to be run every 500 milliseconds, some of them may have to be run every 2 minutes right. So, so this is called scheduling, so, so there has to be a mechanism of scheduling tasks at the appropriate time, so that computational resources are utilized and all the tasks are finished at their before their deadlines ok. So, this is generally done using a uh, technology called scheduling and uh, we will we'll, we'll not go much into that because that is uh, that is in the domain of real time systems, uh, but generally in the case of PLCs even when there are, there are scheduling PLC schedulings are generally very simple and they are static in the sense that they are the, the strategy which is adopted is fixed it does not change according to situations generally. Similarly, they have very uh, rudimentary kind of operating systems much less uh, generally much less uh, sophisticated than standard other operating systems like Unix. Uh, apart from that, but, but, but one thing is very interesting that when you have a PLC I mean these computational tasks are very mission critical in, in nature in the sense that we do not want to have any kind of errors in them. So, they should have very good reliability and they should ensure always ensure worst case performance specifications. We cannot check average case performance specifications uh, like for example, you know you, you know if you have an if you have ethernet then we know that ethernet worst case performance is generally very I mean goes down significantly compared to its average case performance. So, but here where whatever technology we are using we should always use we should generally always use worst case performance as the performance guarantee because the consequences of a task failure could be very great right. Lastly often it happens that this computational environment uh, computational tasks have to be performed 
at very you know harsh physical environments environments having lot of dust heat moisture vibrations and such things so the hardware has to be such that it is not affected by these one has to devise uh, you know proper uh, proper ceilings one has to devise uh, proper uh, cooling mechanisms these are also very important uh, in the case of industrial automation uh, computer systems to to ensure that the tasks are performed reliably and uh, as expected so having said that let's look at what makes a plc so as i have said that a plc is basically a microprocessor based system so as we know that a microprocessor based system will have the the major components are number 1 cpu number 2 memory number 3 input output number 4 power and number 5 the buses right so here also you will find basically the same things so here you have the cpu this is the cpu and here is the memory as we will see memory can be of various types and you will find you you can you can you can easily make out that the plc applications are very rich in io because their basic job is to interact with the physical world right so so there so you have various kinds of io for example you have analog io you have digital io you have remote or sometimes called distributed io you also have network communication much of it is again io so you have various kinds of io you have man machine interface which is also a kind of io input output then you have the you have a programmer which by which you can develop a program program let's say an rll program and you can load it into the plc memory that's also a kind of io then you have power you have the backplane that this is the bus which connects the various plc elements sometimes you have you must be knowing that sometimes you have you know other processors which assist the main processor so you you could have a you could have a this is not common this is uh, this is wrong what i meant to write is a communication processor right so please correct this by which i wanted to mean that this is a communication processor you know because it has to a plc is has to sometimes communicate with special purpose devices so it that job is often given to a separate processor similarly it could have separate input output processor it could even have a network processor in fact a communication processor part of the job is to do do communication maybe on maybe on the network environment also sometimes you have separate these are actually io which are intelligent in the sense that they have their own computing capabilities so one needs to so the so the main cpu needs to talk to it so therefore this is also a kind of io so you see that a plc is basically and basically a microprocessor based system with a with a with a lot of io uh and we are going to see what these different types of ios are so let's look at these modules at some level of depth now okay so you have a processor a typical processor would be i mean this is just an example it could be 80186 it could also be from the 68000 line various various uh, choices are available sometimes these processors are you know uh, proprietary not standard processors uh along with the standard processor as i said you could have coprocessors for specific purposes like io like like handling the programming input etc or ma managing the network you obviously have ram ram is required for running it you have sometimes you have dual ported ram dual ported ram is ram in which simultaneously one it has it has two ports 
So, it can be simultaneously written into and read from. Okay? This is important especially when you want to when you want to uh, when you want to read data from devices which are which are which are working without really stopping the device operation you want to read data or you want to write data so you can on the fly parameterize dump some new parameters for a plc while the plc is working so the plc continuously uses its memory but in between when when during those brief instances when it's not using the memory if you have a dual ported ram then using another processor you could write the same memory and you know uh, download your parameter values in the meantime into the memory which the plc will use as it gets them okay so this kind of you know reading and writing on the fly by another processor is possible if you have dual ported ram you have eprom or e square prom these are typically you know read only memories and they're used for storing the 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 plc programs you have programmer ports which are used for downloading programs you have network ports you have backup battery this is very important because by any chance if you have power failure you don't want number one your your process state to be lost number two you don't want to lose your parameters so there is a backup battery always which will back up part of the ram and you obviously need the power supply which is which could be internal within the processor module or it could be external as, as a separate power supply module which will connect to the processor module it could be either way so let's look at a typical plc system a picture which will clarify the things so here is a typical plc system so you can see that it contains multiple cpu units actually you know these are if you look at them that these are the various cpu units okay so these are the cpu units some of them are communication some of them could be communication processors or other coprocessors one of them will be the main processor there are a number of rack mounted io modules so these are the rack mounted io modules io racks each one of them will will plug in one particular io card which will have various which will interface a number of io signals and you have the power supply here right so this is how it typically looks you can see a number of you know you can see a number of ports so for example you have a number of ports here right so these are probably the communication processors we can't because they they are having so many you know rs232 ports serial ports look like there are there are there are some there are some parallel ports looks like 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 printer ports so this is how a plc actually looks like there are actually this is not the only type plc systems could be very large they could be very small everything comes into one box that is also possible this is a medium range kind of application so having looked at that let's see how these various things are schematically connected we just saw a diagram so so you see that this is the this is the this this is a scheme in which these various processors and the modules are connected they are all connected by a bus this is and obviously as you have seen that various io modules are mounted in racks so there will be a there will be a ribbon cable like thing there will be a flat cable which will act as this bus you know it will connect the various modules and sometimes these modules can even may not be situated at the on the on the same row sometimes they will be connected one after the other sometimes they may be connected in a in a in a cabinet which is a little distance away so this bus really has to extend sometimes using cables also so you have 
central processor, various kinds of coprocessors, I/O processor. You know, nowadays we are we are having the age of you know embedded processors. So some of these processors are use even DSPs. So there could be numeric coprocessors or or, or I/O processors. Generally, there are communication processors for specific communication to you know kinds of devices like operator stations or for communication on the network. There are various kinds of I/O modules. Some of them have processors on them, so they are called intelligent I/O. Some of them are you know ordinary I/O, which just takes signals and feeds it to the central processor. Plus, there are obviously memories. So this is the basic hardware architecture, which is very common for microprocessor system. They are generally organized around a bus. And if you see inside one processor, that's also pretty standard, in the sense that you know you have, as we all know, that all microprocessor systems are, are have two kinds of buses. One kind of bus is called a data bus. Another kind of bus is called an address bus. So using address buses, we can talk to specific devices, and then we can exchange data over the data buses. So you know this is the these are the data buses connects to various devices and these are the address buses by which the devices can be selected. You have the main processor. You have various kinds of memory. You have application memory where the where the computational tasks run. Even for running tasks, you need a <coughs> I mean for managing the resources of the PLC, you need some you know programs which are typically called systems programs. So for that, you need systems program memory. You need systems data memory. You have, you know, special kinds of PLC systems are, you know, just like your. You must have experienced that sometimes your your PC hangs; it just sits quiet, doing nothing. Somehow it gets it gets <coughs> mired into some, you know, infinite kind of loop. So this is prohibited in in PLC systems if due to uh, from reasons like wrong programming to memory uh, <coughs> memory corruption. If the processor gets is stops doing useful work, then there has to be explicit mechanisms by which the processor execution must be be, be brought out of it and taken into a safe state. So <coughs> this is typically done by watchdog timers, which are hardware devices, and sometimes they are also <coughs> I mean uh, yeah yeah they are they are actually hardware devices. And if these timers find no proper activity over certain periods of time, then they by force take the processor to some safe state. Okay. So you could have you know dual ported RAMs, as I said, apart from the normal RAMs. Obviously, the these have the, there has to be various kinds of interfaces. Sometimes you know here they have shown here we are seeing a a particular <coughs> another additional processor. See, this is the main processor. But we are seeing an additional processor, and the job of this processor is to is to is to is to interface with the programmer, so that you can while this system is working, you know, a PLC system is, is typically interface with the machine, and industrial machines often run continuously. So you must provide mechanisms, <coughs> excuse me, so that you are able to load new parameters, read status. You are able to work with the system while the system is working with the machine so without stopping it so so for that since since not only you need a dual ported ram you need another processor which will talk to the programmer while the processor is while the main processor is actually busy controlling the machine right so this is what is done <coughs> so typically these processor modules though this is mainly a discussion on hardware we are we would like to mention that this typically these processor modules come with uh, some pre-programmed software minimal pre-programmed software more than that you want us to develop or want us to uh, take from additional libraries so you you have standard you standard things that some standard things are supported like for example basic counting timing functions some software up down counters quite a bit quite a few of them actually from 0 to 999 typically I mean typically typical value and several timers which can time of which can time durations of the order of milliseconds to order 
two of the order of several several hours or even sometimes days are available you have various you know standard control algorithms already pre coded so that the users uh, do not have to <coughs> can easily configure their systems the program execution in these systems is very interesting there are there are generally three four different types of program execution mode specified for example a mode could be cyclic by cyclic we mean that you, you have a you have a number of computational tasks begin just like rll program execution so begin here come to the end start all over again so this just goes on typically cycle time remains more or less constant but it could vary a little bit depending on the program logic hmm? for example if you have a if you have some program control statements if then else kind of statements then whether some block will be executed or not will will actually depend on the data so program execution time is not always constant it, it actually depends on data but roughly <coughs> it will be constant and in fact it is it is preferable that it is constant so that you are not surprised that that for some value of data suddenly your suddenly your program execution takes a very long time and your deadlines are missed so it is uh, it is preferred that real time programs have predictable and not too much varying uh, time requirements so for many uh, classes of application cyclic is good enough so that is the simplest <coughs> apart from that you could have uh, time controlled executions where certain operations will start after certain times either absolute time or relative times that is start the pump after 30 seconds of opening the valve this kind of controls can be executed so exactly 30 seconds after so so, so this execution is timer controlled or time controlled or it could be interrupt driven there are there are some tasks which can suddenly occur like you know like your know, failures kind of tasks which once they occur they they are not taken into the consideration of the regular computing flow but once they occur they are they are they are required to have very high probability uh, very high priority i'm sorry and therefore they have to immediately get the attention of the processor so such tasks are sometimes uh, coded in the interrupt driven execution mode so whatever the processor was doing it will be interrupted and this requirement will be catered to so uh, but all said and done for a given i mean typically one must understand that typically a plc has much less com computational capability compared to a pc although it is generally uh, much more expensive or that is if you take plc's and pc's of the same kind of price then you would find that the that the plc is much much less computationally capable compared to a i mean a normal pc which sells in the market both in terms of memory and in terms of computing speeds that's because you know price of things get actually decided by the sales volume plus the plc has certain other feature they they are actually very really rugged and they are a uh, different kind of packaging so all these things uh, make this and 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 the sec and the third reason is that a plc is not a <coughs> is not a general purpose <coughs> computer so i mean no one is going to download uh, uh, nice files from the internet and uh, store it there and then your uh, emails keep piling up such things do not happen so therefore memory requirements are generally well understood and much less than what is required so therefore they are one keeps things only which is required because one wants to make things reliable and putting too many things into machine makes it unreliable right so but one has to understand that these are although they are much like pcs in fact there are the the in the market the competitors of uh, plcs are actually called industrial pcs which are really pcs run on i mean run on similar operating systems windows <coughs> or some some versions of it but they are actually they have generally much lower computational capabilities so we have <coughs> then we look at input modules input modules basically convert process level signals to processor levels so what do we mean by process level signals process level signals are signals which actually exist on the field for example they could be uh, they could be <coughs> <coughs> 24 volt dc signals <coughs> or 230 volt ac signals 
or even sometimes contacts sometimes some 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 rtd platinum rtd or could be a 4 to 20 milliampere current loop the signals which actually come out of sensors right a sensors and actuators are devices so these a PLC is an electronic device, it is actually a digital electronic device. So, you it, it as such cannot take in that kind of electrical signal. So, it must convert them to processor level signals which are which are digital typically 5 volt or maybe 2.5 volt whatever. So, that job is actually done by the input modules. So, their job is to basically translate process level signals to processor level signals. Also convert them from analog to digital sometimes if they are not always digital. <coughs> so, the jobs are mainly another important thing is to provide isolation because the electronics if you if you if you expose a uh, uh, digital electronics board to 115 volt or 230 volt AC directly chances are that it will get damaged. So, you have to provide electrical or galvanic isolation using optocouplers. So, input modules very often provide that they provide fault indication suppose some wire has broken often they provide fault indication this is apart from converting process level signals to processor level signals. They are generally of two types they are either analog inputs or digital inputs we understand the difference between them right. So, for example, a contact would be a digital input and uh, a platinum RTD would be an analog input. So, obviously, we, we need for the analog input modules we, we need to have uh, analog to digital conversion <laughs> typically 12 bits accuracy multi channel sometimes. <coughs> one input module generally supports several physical in one input module supports several input channels. So, there are since each digital channel actually takes one bit while one each analog channel could take as much as 8 or 12 bits. So, therefore, Typically an, an input module will will support you know 32, 64, 128 kind of digital input channels while it will support 8, 16 or 32 analog channels. This, these are just some, some, some typical values. Similarly, sometimes it takes special inputs like you can connect directly connect thermocouples, you can directly connect RTDs. So, inputs can be in the form of voltage, current, resistance etcetera. <coughs> Sometimes it can be in the form of pulses for example, a shaft angle encoder can be sometimes connected. So, this is the nature of input modules. Then we have output modules they do the reverse they translate processor level signals to process level signals they are they are they are output devices and and these process level signals then go to things like motors, solenoid lamps, valves they have to actually do work right. So, they have to be converted in form generally they have to made sometimes mostly they have to make be made analog or sometimes even on off kind of signals, but they have to be increased in power because they are supposed to do work right. <coughs> so, they also provide isolation and for analogs it has to provide the voltage or current voltage and current drive. So, typically a unit that will provide that will be a let us say a servo amplifier. So, such amplifiers will be put on output modules. For digital output modules you know sometimes they will require high power you will just give a pulse and you will require that during the duration of the pulse there will be a volt there will be high high current will be switched. So, that such a thing will be done by the output modules it is typically let us say using triac or maybe an IGBT today today one we, one would like to probably use an IGBT. And they could also be <coughs> potential free relay contacts you know that is sometimes we we do the we, we can do suppose we want to switch a voltage or current because it is a it is digital. So, it has to be on off kind of thing. So, you so you could actually do it in two ways one way is to use a device electronic device which will interrupt another is to do a mechanical interrupter. Now, since these currents can be sometimes very large. So, therefore, you do not directly from the output module you do not interrupt a large load current you actually use a relay 
which activates a contactor. So the contactor is actually a heavy device, heavy contacts, you might have seen them. And they provide contacts and if you drive those, if you drive a signal into it, then some relay will make the contactor work. So using a low power signal, you can interrupt a high current using a contactor and relay. So such outputs can be driven from, from, from digital output modules. So let's have look at some some of these pictures. For example, this is a typical this is how a typical analog I/O module looks like. Uh, let's look let's see what it contains. So, uh, for example, you will find that there are some analog signal terminations, probably here, and there are some bus ports probably here, difficult to see this. Inside the you will have you know the, these typically this is an analog so support several channels so there has to be eddy conversion typically you do not put if it is not that if you have 16 channels you will require 16 eddy converters you will take one eddy converter and the eddy converter is so fast that it will first, first convert this channel then this channel then this channel then this channel and so on. So it will multiplex the AD conversion. So you have multiplex AD conversion. At the same time, you, you need to ensure that, that although you are taking the values one after the other, but you would like to ensure that the values that you are taking finally all belong to the same time instant in the process. So you use XK, YK, ZK, all of them are at K time instant. So for that, you need simultaneous sample and hold where you take the value simultaneously using sample and hold circuits and you hold them and then the ID converter picks them up. And you also have various output drivers, especially for output model modules. So this is the basic, these are the basic thing that an analog IO module will contain. And of course, some logic for synchronization. Then you have a different kind of IO modules which are called distributed or sometimes called uh, remote IO modules. So these are actually intelligent field mountable I.O. devices. So you actually put the I.O. module right there on the machine and from there you draw a wire or you connect it to a network or you take an input output concentrator and connect several local distributed I.O.s and then make one digital, digital communication back to the PLC. The advantages are mainly in savings in cabling costs. I might have mentioned before that cabling costs are are non, uh, uh, not insignificant part of any industrial automation project. So, and they generally cause inconveniences in an industrial environment. They are uh, difficult to maintain, sometimes may get cut, etc. So, savings in cable costs and maintenance costs are significant. Then, they are they are sometimes they, I mean especially when when they are on the network, they are actually programmable from a um, parameterizable from a processor or a programmer. They have because they uh, they generally communicate with the processor over they first of all they communicate with the processor infrequently because they can they are they are actually intelligent themselves and they can do much of their work secondly they often communicate with using digital communication protocols which are much more uh, reliable so you have much improved data integrity your cost of cable etc comes down so typically used for applications like you know very close positioning with analog digital encoders which requires frequent sampling, frequent slow output generation, very difficult to do it with the central processor because it will get loaded. High speed counters, which needs to count high speed events like you know fast moving shaft, uh, shafts, angle pulses. Some specific loop controllers, temperature control loop, etc., where you just need to download the set point from the central processor and the basic loop works on the distributed I.O. module. So this main processor is not bothered with that. So that is a distributed I.O. generally getting more and more uh, popular now these days. Then you have some other kinds of modules called function modules. These are also, these are not, sometimes they could also be mounted on the machine and make part of a distributed I.O. But otherwise they may be situated on the PLC rack itself. But still they are, they are actually independent modules that can execute tasks independently. So basically reducing the central processor load. 
that it needs to talk to it less often for precision and high speed tasks and they often have their own logic their own pre coded control laws they have their own you know optimizing abilities it might tune its own you just have to give it a command that you tune yourself so it will it, it has its own code it will actually tune a control loop and typical application would be stepper or stepper servo control multi axis synchronization as we have uh, we will see after just following this we will go into the manufacturing the cnc machine controls where we will find that there are there are many cases where a precise two dimensional motion has to be created suppose we are you are you are actually cutting something along a surface so you have to create precise two dimensional motion so you have to give motions along two axis motion commands and they have to be very synchronized so that is called multi axis synchronization for such applications typically you use function modules specialized function modules and sometimes they are, they could be also used with distributed io systems to to be situated on the machines themselves this is a this is another controller which is a valve control module i chose this because i wanted to sh show the power transistors on this so you, you you can see the power transistors so it has to drive valve means it can it's probably a probably a hydraulic servo valve or something or so it has to pull a solenoid create some force so that the so the piston moves <coughs> so for that it needs to provide good amount of current so you have the these are the power transistor drives it takes set point from outside so it inter interfaces to, to the bus and the central processor gives it the set point and it has its own on board controller right so this is a typical valve this is another picture a counter module you can't make out much on the picture except for the fact that you can see certain things you know uh, like for example oops we need to go back so you see you, you can see that for example this is th th this module contain uh, i think five counters so you see the count value has to be read on the bus so these have count values have to be read then event signals that is go up 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 this thing has to come so there are <coughs> probably five counters here on the other hand it also connects to the bus so that these signals can be read generally used for <coughs> so this so the count is readable on the fly because it contains dual ported ram and high speed count so generally used for very high speed counts so one could one would have large registers and things like that this is this is a counter position decoder see uh, most most counter modules can easily be used because position decoding is often uh, by by counting the shaft angle pulses <coughs> shaft angle encoder pulses that are coming over a certain period of time or <coughs> because every pulse will mean a certain small angle rotation so if you want to have shaft angle position decoder it's basically counting pulses so so some i mean some of these you know uh, some of these can be used for uh, this can be used for either as a counter or as a position decoder so you have pulse inputs you can count or you can read shaft position and both all, all they will be readable on the fly as we said and for high speed so this is just to you know give give you and give you a give you a feel of the plc system this is what this is a position control module so again uh position control module on board dedicated high speed cpu position control is generally requires very fast computation so you have dedicated high speed cpu high, by by high speed cpu means you have cpu with you know higher capabilities you used higher uh, order processors when you have low speed uh, controllers you use uh, you know generally you use things like microcontrollers to realize them while here you you could use higher end processor like maybe 68000 <coughs> and more, uh, motor drive so on the on the motor so it gives the there is a drive there is there will be a power electronic drive 
which will be given a set point and that poly electronic drive will realize that set point. On the other hand it will take its own set point it, it will take from the central processor. It has it has digital I O depending on what is the final motor various for example for a for a for a stepper motor it is actually driven by digital I O. So these are some of these modules which are used in PLC systems. It has a programmer port because you need to there are there are a large number of parameters which have to be set <coughs> and set point comes from the data bus. So all these modules how they are connected that is what are the various data paths to understand this you have to understand that the PLC I am sorry this. So the PLC is as we say, have said that it, that it's rack mounted right. So, 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 so there are a number of racks it is like an Almira there are a number of racks in each rack there are slots. So, in each slot you can put I O modules or you can put C P U modules and in each slot so this is slot this is rack and in each slot contains several channels right. So, there could be 8 analog channels so channels. So, this is how I O is actually organized it is it is rack slot channel. So, if you want to identify a particular physical signal you have to this is you have to have a rack slot channel addressing which is implemented in various ways by various manufacturers. Now, all these racks must be connected. So, these they are actually connected at this level by ribbon cables and then from from rack to rack connection is generally achieved ok we will see this in the next diagram we will see it in the next diagram. So, here you are. So, these are you know this is one one rack let us say this is one rack then you can have several racks for example, so they are, they are actually connected by what are known as interface units. So, these are interface modules similarly. So, you can you, you can expand your number of modules sometimes you can put as I was telling that you can put your modules in a different Almira which is different cabinet when I say Almira actually it is a cabinet. So, for that you need to have <coughs> a special you know special interface unit. So, typically an interface unit will it can be say typically such distance for reliable data transmission such distance requirements are there at a certain rate. So, go you can go up to something like you know, 100 meters which is a lot and sometimes you can have remote interfacing that is actually you have you may be having your CPU in some uh, that is your basic PLC system in some control room while you have these various interface units in the various shop floors which which could be even you know half a kilometer away and things like that. So, in for such cases you need special interface units which are called remote interface units. So, this is the way that all these elements are actually connected with each other and buses are extended. then all these things that are happening one generally wants to get a wants to get a view of it. So, to get a view of it you use a man machine interface and as such PLC modules often work without any without any intervention from humans. So, so as such they have very little uh, you know uh, MMI capability they do not have generally contain displays by themselves they will probably contain some LEDs which will just uh, indicate whether they are whether they are functioning normally or not. But if you want to visualize, if you want to monitor what is happening to the various variables, if you want to trend them, show it nicely to a to a to an operator, it, it is possible through the various man machine interface elements. So, you can have operator panels by which an operator can give commands to a variety of devices, some of them may be some of them may be mobile, they may, it may be push button, joystick, various kinds of you know multifunction input pa uh, panels, various kinds of things. 
Similarly, he can see it, he can, you can actually connect a PC to a PLC and on which uh, various kinds of visualization software which will nicely show your plant and you know as you know I mean uh, levels of fluids will go up and down, it will nicely show you on the screen. So such visualization software running on PCs can be used for man machine interfaces. Sometimes especially in for power applications you have remote terminal units that is basically the, the system is working in let us say unmanned stations and from from kilometers away you want to get a view of what is happening let us say which of the uh, which of the transmission lines are on which are off. So such a system is called a supervisory control and data acquisition system often called SCADA and so SCADA systems with, with, with RTUs give, gives operators a, a, a visualization of what is happening uh, quite far away in uh, unmanned places they are also MMI. Uh, they also have a MMI purpose. Sometimes you have panel PCs, they are special types of PCs with you know touch screen so that the operator you know need not type, he can just for, for basically convenience because an operator has to concentrate on the process and should not be bogged down with you know the, it should be as easy for him to give commands as possible. So people use you know devices like touch screens in such environments. So for example, these are, these are so there could be a variety of you know man machine interface kind of uh, devices which needs to be interfaced with a PLC starting from operator panels to monitors to PCs to keyboards to printers. So, so, so all these it is it is it is, it is possible to uh, interface. Then you have to have programming devices and this is a this is a typical programmer programmers are of two types either they could be handheld which you can take to the shop floor and directly program the PLC or they could be tabletop where, where, where you have which are of uh, higher uh, capabilities and <coughs> where you actually develop programs offline and maybe go and just, just, just load it there because these have very good program development environments also. <coughs> Finally another very important thing is communication. So there are various types of communications available as, as, as we have already told for example point to point where you run direct wires from an, from an input or output module to the actual device. They could be uh, bus communication is actually internal to the, to the modules or you could be network communications where uh, net, network or remote these we have already explained. Communication technology could be communication medium can be various for example it can be radio it can be coaxial channels, it can be fiber optic uh, cables, so different physical media may be supported, are supported, various protocols are supported for example RS-232, uh, 4 to 20 milliampere current loop, for RS-422, 485, these are, <coughs> these are point to point communication protocols. Apart from that there could be network protocols, for example industrial ethernets are sometimes used. Uh, where the computational requirements are well known, well understood and you know that uh, due to uh, mm, yeah, that is CSMA CD uh, media access protocol you are not going to get uh, performance is, is, is not going to degrade. You have a field bus that is a, that's, that's a new standard for networking in, in the industrial environment which we, we shall be studying it much more detail. There are other less popular uh, probably I can call them less popular for example the CAN bus, the CAN bus is much more popular in, in another application environment that is automobiles, field bus is gaining uh, popularity in the industrial environment and some, of, some, some, some buses could be you know proprietary for example Sien, uh, Siemens has a, has a bus called Scenic which is a proprietary protocol bus. The advantages of distributed network IO are well understood, cost saving on maintaining integrity of high speed signals because digital, com basically the advantages of digital communication and the advantages of having an intelligent module near the machine. So you can have good sensor diagnostics, false, fault can be much more you know monitoring functions can be realized without overloading the CPU. You can do special functions like, like startup, so in a sense in such cases the PLC CPU it really works like a supervisory system and the actual controls is done on the spot. So you have better centralized coordination monitoring. So we have come to the end of the 
lecture and so we have I hope you have got a fairly a fair idea about what makes a PLC system and uh, as is customary again you have some points to ponder. So, think of think whether you can mention two distinguishing features of industrial automation tasks compared to let us say a task in a bank with the, which are also computational tasks which also communicate. Mention five major components of a PLC system we have mentioned more than five. So, you should be able to mention five and distinguish between normal distributed and networked IO. So, here we end today thank you very much we will meet again. So, welcome to uh, lesson 23 of the course on industrial automation and control. Today we will be talking about CNC machines that is numerically computer numerically controlled machines. So, uh, as usual let us look at the instructional objectives of this lesson. So, after learning the lesson the student should be able to describe the main features of a CNC machine, what makes it, describe its main advantages why we should spend money to buy these machines they are very expensive. Explain the main features of part programming because these machines are automated they can be programmed. So, the programs are called part programs. So, we will see some basic features of part programming and finally, the drives the CNC machines create motions all machines create motions machines especially which are used for manufacturing. So, naturally they involve drives the technology which which the which generates the power and the control for creating precise motion against heavy loads we will see there these drives and we will see the requirements on the CNC drive. So, that later on when we study the drive technology we can refer to that and we can we will see how these drives are actually realized using electrical machines power electronics and control. On the other hand the workpiece is rotating at generally at very high speed it is. So, it is rotating uh, at the same time it can come down to actually drill a hole. So, the workpiece in this case is capable of it has a high speed rotation and it can also move along one axis whether the work uh, rather the tool can move along one axis and while rotating and the uh, and the job can move in ha have rectilinear motion have motion a two dimensional motion right. Thank you.